And check this out. Guess who we have in front of your screen right now? Executive producer, director, producer, and writer. Please welcome from the hit TV show on HBO, Ballers. Look at you, Rob Weiss. How are you, buddy? I'm good, man. Eddie, it's amazing. Like the 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 pre the pre on Eddie is slightly different than the on Eddie. I like it though, man. Oh yeah. It's good persona stuff. Yeah, yeah, it was good, man. It was a smooth transition. Um I'm good, buddy. Everything's all right. Uh, you know, it's uh feels like you know, we're getting to like a new normal out here in LA. People are back out, a little more work is getting done. Um so yeah, you know, everybody's safe that I know, so pretty grateful, you know. World's in obvious chaos and despair. Right, right. Yeah. Um, you know. Well, you know, Rob, so, before we talk about ballers, let's talk about let's turn back the clock. You know, this is what I wanna know, all right? Did you always want to become a writer? I mean, when you were in high school, did you say, I want to be a writer? Um, no. I mean, I think in, like, creative writing classes, I probably enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, bro, I, I mean, I was a terrible student, man. I mean, I was really, like, I think, like, you know, I, I graduated, like, high school by the skin of my teeth. Like, that's, I'm, I'm not even exaggerating. I think, like, they were even talking about leaving me back or making me go to summer school for failing Spanish, you know? Oh, jeez. So I wasn't, like, I didn't really excel as a student. So I, did, I didn't really, I didn't really have, like, a big kind of goal or right. a vision for the future, you know? Um, but, I mean, it's just something that evolved. Like, I, I could draw a little bit. So I wound up going to an art school in Manhattan. And then I couldn't, like, really find my medium there. It was Parsons School of Design. Mm -hmm. But then I started taking film classes, and uh, and then I just started to invest in that a little bit more. And then your first job, what was so, Night Promoter? So I think, like, I went to Parsons for, I want to say, like, two years, and I jumped around different departments. And then over a summer break, I mean, some friends and I <laughs> kind of hustled our, hustled our way into uh, throwing this insane party at a brand new club. At the time, it was like, it was brand new. It was the tunnel. Oh, yeah. Which might be before your time. But when it opened up, it was popping. It was a little bit of a scam that I don't really want to get into. But, but we wound up throwing some, like, crazy party there. And I kind of got bit by that bug. So, you know, the bug of actually making money. I think I was, like, 18 at the time. Right. 19 or something like that and uh so i kind of, i took a year off of school and i was just a club promoter so you know one of the clubs i did like most of the stuff i did was in either south shore or long island or in manhattan and it was mostly like taking the kids who kind of like lived in our south shore neighborhood to manhattan like oh okay <laughs> we threw parties at the milk bar and heartbreaks and palladium and all these places Big end of 80s, like, you know, Manhattan spots, New York City spots. And uh, I did that for a year, but it was like, it was really unfulfilling, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, outside of making money. So I wound up going back to school, and that's when I started getting, you know, to uh, invest in film studies. Okay, so 1993, you make a film, right? With, a, with your boys. You got Lou Lombardi, right. Frank uh, Madrano. You also have... Uh, right. I mean, I heard that movie, you had, like, your niece doing the grip or some shit like that, like, the camera work. No. How'd you guys do it? No, I didn't, I didn't know Louie. I didn't know Frank, you know? I mean, most of those guys, most of the people involved in the movie, I actually met through, the like, the movie. It was 1991, and I'd gotten thrown out of the film department at Parsons slash New School. Like, some strange altercation happened in a class, and, like, I just didn't get on with my professor. So he's kind of, like, forced me out of the class, and I'm like, I'm going to go make a movie. He's like, yeah, yeah, shoot it in 70 millimeter. <laughs> and, I mean, I think I was, like, 23 at the time. So I was like, all right, let me write a short film and make a short film. And at that time, I'd moved home to my dad's house. Like, I'd been out on my own, and my dad got remarried. And I was just going through all kinds of, like, 
anxiety issues. You know, I was like 23. Most of my friends that I grew up with had gone away to college, graduated, come home, settled into the, like uh, most of them in Manhattan, jobs on Wall Street or their chosen professions. At least they were on track. And I'm like, fuck, I'm 23 and I'm like floundering. You know, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. So I wound up back at my dad's and I'm like, let me sit down and write this short film. And I started writing, writing, writing. And I was like, wow, I'm at page 30. Wow, I'm at 40. And it just became like a feature. And I, I like, I was too like stupid to think that like I couldn't get it done yet. I didn't know how I was going to get it done. But I wound up, you know, forging these kind of like, I want to say like, relationships with people that were almost like cosmically brought into my life in purpose to make this movie. Mm. And then the rest of the people just kind of came like there's a credible cinematographer who'd never gotten a break as a cinematographer. And there was an IOTC strike. So we actually had this amazing, amazing dolly grip that we never would have gotten and like camera department guys. So it wasn't, it wasn't really, it was super low budget. We started out like 40, $60,000 and then John Pearson, who was a well-known producer's rep, had um, seen some footage that we screened somewhere. I had these two young producers. They'd never produced anything. Super bright guys. One guy was just graduated Yale. The other guy was like out of Wharton. They ran all around the independent film project. I believe that's what it was in New York at the time. And they got they got all these producers to come and see like these selected dailies. And, and John Pearson who was a well-known producer's rep. Gave us like 300 grand to finish it. Um, but most of those guys I didn't know, all the actors. I mean, myself and a lot of my friends from the neighborhood are in it. Mm -hmm. But like in quick hits and little pieces. Right. But like the main actors in it were, were people we found. Like, like we found Pat McGowan, Joe Lindsay. My mother, who was kind of part, part in part, parcel like the, it's, you know, inspiration for me to actually even look at film as a possibility. I'd always studied theater. She's she's actually a theater, you know, teacher out here in the desert now. Mm -hmm. She'd been like she's been teaching theater for a million years, but um, she found Steve Paul Vecchio, who's in the middle of that poster there, because they had done some kind of play together. He passed away a bunch of years ago, which is mm -hmm. really sad. Wow, sorry. Um, but you know, it also and Mira Servino. Mira Servino in there, right? Right, so Mira, that's what I mean, like Mira, like we, we snuck in, me and my friends, one of our usual scams, we snuck into the Goodfellas premiere in New York, you know, and we met Mira. So we kind of just became friends with Mira, and then I'm like, hey, I'm going to make this movie, would you help me cast it? And she was like vying for like the, the female lead role, but for some reason I was always like, no, nah, no. Nah. And then my mother's like, you're crazy, this, that. And then, like, I was like, all right, cool. And then she, she did it, and her career popped after that. I mean, listen, I, I mean, I, I can't profess to have had the answers for everything, you know? You know, but Rob. A lot of things I got really lucky on. But Rob, here's my question. Back then, there wasn't no digital. How the hell did you afford the film? I mean, it's really hard to have, you know, the film's very expensive. Yeah, the film was very expensive. Yes, it was. It was funny, man. We were shooting one scene and we ran out of film. And they were like, dude, we don't have film. And I had asked a friend of mine, Mike Rappaport, not the actor. He's, uh, you know, he was more of a finance guy. Like to invest in, like, he didn't, he didn't, he was not responsive. And then he called me up and he was like, yo, didn't you need money for your movie? And he's like, yeah, yeah, come and pick. He's like, young. And he's like, come pick up a check. So it was like, Wow. Kis like little kismet fate things would happen that we would just keep trudging along. And that day we went, we got the money from him, got filmed. So, um, but like I said, you know, we worked out a lot of deals. You know, I think in New York at the time, they, you know, camera houses, post production facilities, um, a lot of places, you know, were, you know, very supportive of independent filmmakers. Yeah. So, you know, it's not like it's. So here's not that many people were making movies back then. Right, right. But then now, it's not like now. I know, huh? but it's a hit. It was a hit when you went to Sundance, right? Yeah, it was in competition at Sundance. Um, I mean, listen, it's a it's a cult film and it's got its following, and that's it. You know, right? People always ask me where to like 
you know, stream it. And I'm like, I don't even know who fucking owns it. I think it's like MGM or so. I got to figure it out. I'm like, I don't know where it is. I heard it was on YouTube. But then I think like one of the, like the producers got it taken down because they're like, no, we need to have it stream. And then it just vanished everywhere. Right. But listen, I go look for, I go look for State of Grace. I can't find State of Grace either, you know? And that's like, that was a substantially bigger movie with bigger actors than I had. And that's hard to find too. So, you know. But after the Sundance, you know, listen, they offered you, uh, they said, hey, Universal Studios told you, let's go. Come to Hollywood and we got you, right? We want you to work. You well, I was, yeah, I was already out here, but yeah. So you got that. I, think I, shot the, I shot the movie and then we all just kind of moved out here and. I would fly back for like mixes and like, you know, I didn't go back to the call timing, but, but I was kind of like, after it was done and it was pretty much, um, edited, I, I came out here, but yes, I got, I, I had to deal at universal after that. So, so tell me the films that you turned down and I'm talking oh, about, you want to talk about, who wants to talk about the, the shit we turned down? Hold on. Obviously, I turned down everything. I never made another movie. Yeah, but so you, like... let me ask you this. Why'd you turn down films, man? I mean, listen, you came to Hollywood. Everything was going well. You got a lot yeah. of Universal Studios. What the fuck, Rob? Why'd you turn it down? Uh, You know, Rob Weiss at 20... I, I still consider myself a complicated person now. Mm-hmm. But well, Rob Weiss at 26 was substantially complicated. And they needed certain things needed to be, uh, you know, unwound and rewound and, and worked on. And I think, like, for me, that's not the reason I do it. I think I just had a lot of insecurity, you know. I was the kind of guy that, first of all, there's a lot of, there's a lot of layers to it. The reason I didn't pull the trigger right away uh-huh. is because I was super precious and I was like, I want to do what I want to do. So I, I actually had a movie within two years that I was going to make. And, you know, it was Green Linux the Boy, which was a company. And they wound up going out of business. And the movie just got kind of caught up in some whole mm-hmm. Barry Diller company takeover thing. I, I don't know what the hell happened. Couldn't really extricate it out. Then it became about all. And, and I was also attached to American Psycho, which I, I couldn't really figure out how to write. So I left that to go do this Milk Bar movie. Um, and then it became like, just grab a movie and go and make it. And I think for me at that time, I was so insecure about something I didn't write because I couldn't really read between the lines. Like, mm-hmm. what is every, right. you know, nuanced motivation? Where's the camera? I didn't visualize this. So... It was a skill set I hadn't really developed at that time. Um, obviously, it's I'm far more comfortable with it now. It's like everything then that I would obsess over. The, the, the non, the not, you know, I mean, well, Rob, I don't think now, I don't not, think I don't think you were insecure. I just felt like you weren't comfortable. No, I was. No, I was. No, it was. It was like it was a lot of insecurity. It was a lot of can I do this? Was I was I a fluke? It was every negative kind of thought you could have and then i you know listen man there's nothing that a good decade of therapy can't fully right. like help you reconfigure you know so, so i film, um the next film goodwill hunting did you turn that down too yeah but that was like i mean that was you know i don't i didn't even really understand what was going on there there's a lot of conversation about that script at the time mm-hmm. um and a lot of places felt like i should do it and that was kind of the defining thing. Like when my movie fell apart, they were like, you need to go make this movie. I remember sitting with my agent at the time and one, and one of the other heads of ETA and them kind of pressured me to do it. And at the time I read the script and I was like, like I didn't even read the whole script. I was like, I didn't really know what was going on in the script. So it was like 10, 15 pages in. I just remember like the whole thing was in a bar or something. I was like, I don't know this. And, you know, I just, I don't know, I wasn't feeling it. But listen, at the place my head was at back then, Mm -hmm. had I done that movie, there might not be any Ben Affleck on Matt Damon now. So, you know, it's (laughs) like, I just don't know. I don't know that that was like, it wasn't really the the right time for me. Like, I'm not like, like, I don't like define myself by like this business or what I do. I really don't, man. I'm not like. Like, for a guy who's in Hollywood, like, I, I, I am a part of this landscape, mm-hmm. and probably so, but I don't, 
I, I don't know, man. Like, I, I have a lot of interest. I've never been like, if I don't do this, I'm going to die. If I don't make it doing that, I'm going to die. I'm just kind of like, yo, I just don't want to starve, you know. Right huh. now, I want to be a great dad. I want to be healthy. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, so I never, like, I, I, I didn't really, I think, like, the only time I really had regrets was after that period. That period kind of took me to the end of my 20s. And my early 30s were pretty tricky. Like, for some reason back then, it was kind of like, there wasn't, like, a lot of guys now make, the guys I idolized even back then, like Michael Mann, that guy would make a movie, like, every five years. It wasn't like, how awesome. but for some reason. How awesome is that movie? Yeah, it was awesome. Man. Yeah, it was awesome. I, was on, I was on set of Heat with Tom Sizemore. Yeah. Because I, 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 yeah, like, Tom lived upstairs for me in my place that first lived when I was out here. But, um. What was I going to say? Uh, yeah, it was like, but back then, for some reason with me, you know, the fact that like two, three years had gone by and I hadn't made a movie, it was kind of like, oh, fuck that guy. Right. But I think it was also like people, you know, I had a lot of anxiety. People, I think, might have, you know, misinterpreted that at times, like it's being mm -hmm. aloof, like, right. you know, I, mean, I wouldn't want to sit with people. I'd just be like, I was, I was pretty anxious, man, you know, mm -hmm. unlike now. I'm like, now there's just... With every with every decade of your life, you get less anxious. Well, yeah, you know what I mean. Kind of like I don't give a fuck. You there know? you go. That's the Rob Weiss I like, baby. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean I, we're talking, dude. We're going back twenty five years, bro. I know. You know Turning I mean? back the clock when gas was like you know eighty cents a gallon. I get it. So yeah, here's my question: How the hell did you get Entourage? Did you turn it down? Did you did you felt like you know you're a film guy? You don't care about TV? Talk to me. Did you ever have Doug on here? You know Doug too, right? Yeah, I know Doug. Did yeah. you ever have Doug on here? No, but I told him to get on my I'm, show. Yeah, yeah. Like Doug, Doug will tell you that story. That was funny. It was like, um, I mean, I've known Doug since high school. He, we were in a prep school together. He left after he had to go back to the high school in his hometown. But we, we were always friendly. And he kind of came, you know, he was interested in film. So he came by when I was casting amongst friends. And he was around a lot of it. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, just in that follow-up period when he was at AFI, we all knew each other out here. So, um, you know, I even went to set when he was shooting the pilot. I don't know. I was still kind of, like, hell-bent on, like, I'm going to get back out there and make another indie, you know. I'm going to go out there and uh, make that follow-up, even though it had been, like, fucking 10 years or something, right? You know, and I'm just like, wow, where's the time going? And I can't get a break and this and that. So I was kind of like, yeah. He'd be, he called me up. He was like, Look, they picked us up. I'm going to need writers. Come watch the pilot. Talk to me and Lev and Steve Levinson and Larry Charles about it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll come in next week. And then I was like, I don't want to go, you know, because I had worked on like another show briefly and I knew some of the guys on it. And like, it was just a weird dynamic. Like, people, like, I just didn't vibe with certain people, even though I, I thought we were friends beyond. It was just a very. It wasn't, like, I don't want to get too into detail on it, but it wasn't the best experience of my life. So I was kind of like, I think a little bit gun shy from that. And I just kind of didn't show up. Doug called me again. He's like, yo, you're going to come down and watch the pilot. I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah, this week. And then I was still kind of flaky because I wasn't really feeling it. And Doug's like talking to our friends. Like, I don't understand. This guy have money, like secret money nobody knows about, <laughs> which I did. I assure you, I did not. Um, I was pretty fucking in debt at that point. <laughs> and, you know, my girlfriend at the time was pretty upset with me because of said debt, you know, and, right. with, and my lack of desire to go on the show. And she was just, you know, he called me again. And I was like, yeah, bro, I just want to go make a movie or something, you know. And he was like, all right, all right. And then my girlfriend was just, you know, so disappointed. She was just like, well, at least you could have called your agent. Just call her. And she says, so I called at the time it was, uh, Leslie Maskin is now Leslie shoot yeah Leslie Maskin at UTA. I was like, hey, you know about the show Entourage, of course. I said, you know, yeah, you know, my friends, uh, my friend created it. They want to talk to me about being on it, and uh, she was like, of course, you got to do it, you got to do it. I was like, you know, basically, I'm like, well, I want to make a movie. She's like, look, your career is ice cold. If you want to get back into the movie game, do this show. And then you'll be able to do that. I'm like, really? So then I called up Doug. I'm like, yeah, bro, I'm in. He's like, dude, two minutes ago you were out. So then I went down there and I'm like, I did my thing. And 
And then HBO didn't want me. They're like, because they knew amongst friends, they were like, oh, he's like dark, Doug's like, he's the funniest guy I know. Mm-hmm. And that became another whole, then all of a sudden I'm like fighting for this job. And, Holy shit. You know, tap dancing and all this shit. <laughs> and then I did it. And I remember after season one, like, I didn't know if the show was going to be anything. I, You know, I, to be completely honest, I was like, is this just ridiculous, this show? I had no idea. I, I just, I couldn't gauge it. And, um, you know, I, people really receptive. The season one was there. And I was like, holy shit, all right, all right. Maybe this is a kind of a game changer. And then I remember getting, like, a call from, like, Paramount. And they wanted me to come in and talk about some, like, movie. And I think it was, like, with Usher. And I'm in a room with all these people, and I was just kind of like this again. They were like, this woman, I forgot who it was, man. She was dope. She was like, she's like, baby, relax. We want you. You don't have to pitch anything today. It was it was so cool. And then I remember calling my agent going like, I don't think I'm going to go back to that show. I'm going to go make movies. And she was like, the fuck is wrong with you? If you get on a hit show, you ride that wave. And then I just, I just shut up, and I did that, and that just kind of... That wave is just, you know, it's been. Uh, when did you feel com- when did you feel comfortable, Rob, with Entourage? You said, you know what, fuck it, I love this, I'm gonna do this. Uh, yo, I enjoyed the process, man. I really did. I mean, we it was a gru- it was grueling at times for us because I think that, in a lot of ways, and you know, we were, you know, we we weren't seasoned veterans. We were like right. immature young writers still, you know. Um, you know, learning how to do a show together. So it was tough, but at times it was clicking. You're writing things that you're enjoying writing and then actually producing them. And it was like enjoyable, but mostly like, it's weird. Like I don't live my life like by the standard of what other people necessarily think about me, but in terms of creating, I kind of do, you know what I mean? Meaning like, for a show to have an audience is the greatest blessing ever. And a loyal audience and people love it. Like, I'm not into, like, I'm going to go make a movie for me. Like, I'm not, like, self-indulgent like that with creating. I want to make things for people, you know, and, and for an audience. So I think that that was a big part of what was enjoyable, was watching, like, you know, how it was kind of, like, being um, received by the culture. You know, and how it was also pushing culture, you know, which is something that um, I think has become like important in terms of at least the handful of projects I've done is, you know, how can we inform culture? How can we keep it moving? Be a little zeitgeist in the vein of what's now, you know what I mean? And or what's next, you know, so. Were you um, uh, were you in the room too? like, you know, like let's say season two, they had a. Uh... A guest star reoccurring. Would you be in the room as far as when they cast? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, like, as yeah. a, for you as a writer, right? Let's just say a person, you know, he or she's auditioning and they ad lib. Do you get upset because it's like, yo, it's your words. Stick with the page. I mean, stick no. with the words. No. No. Okay. No, I mean, I mean, I'd be upset if they changed every word and they were like, "Well, your scene sucked." But right. it's like, no, man. It's like. You know, you, like you, people have to kind of take what's there and play it to their strengths, right? Mm-hmm. If you're an actor, it's like, I mean, I think the worst thing I see is when people, I mean, again, because I, I don't want to like, I don't want it to be transparent or what I'm saying so that anybody Oh, knows. no, listen. So, he's, no, I wouldn't want to say what I'm going to say so that that would hurt anybody's feelings. But I've seen actors that I've been close with go up for things that are so not them that I'm like, there's not a chance in the universe they're gonna wind up getting it. And like, they'll cover themselves with fake tattoos and this, and you're like, listen, just just make it as real to you as possible. You know what I mean? And find that part of yourself that connects with it. And if it's yours, it's yours. If it's not the next one, maybe, you know what I mean? It's like, I think that, you know, people have to understand it's like, we see people and it's like, sometimes we really know what we want, but then somebody could come in and you go, that's actually what we want. Or the person just walks in and you go, yeah, that's the person. It's like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, so you think but yeah, of- I, I, the words, the words aren't that important. I mean, the words are important, you know, 
in terms of moving the story. And you don't right. want somebody like going, yeah, I didn't like that line. I mean, but nobody does that. You know what I mean? It's just that people might bend things a little bit to play to their strengths. You well, know? you know why I'm asking? Because a lot of uh, multiple camera uh, writers and, you know, comedy writers, you know, they get upset when they're like, hey, I busted my ass six hours crafting the writing. And you're fucking. I don't do I don't do multicam, buddy. The, well, that's what I mean. But it's even right. half hour single camera. They still get upset. Some of these writers, they're like, no, you listen. But some writers could be, could be jerk offs. You know, they're like, oh, listen, that's my yeah. writing. Stick with it. You know. And I'm saying even like three words off because they're saying to themselves, I crafted this shit, and you're not, you know, you're not saying my line. Some writers have like egos, do they, Rob? What do you think? I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know any of those guys. I got to be honest with you. I really don't. I mean, I've never worked with anybody like that. You know, I've right. only done three shows, but mm -hmm. certainly it's not like that on Ballers, man. On Ballers, me and Levinson would be throwing lines out at Dwayne like, yo, DJ, say that. Like, we're just throwing shit in, <laughs> which was the greatest luxury to actually be directing scripts that we had written. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just changing shit on the fly, and our cast was so fucking talented that they're like, all right, got it. It, it, it was awesome, man. But no, I, I don't know. I'm not like that, oh, you know? All right. So, like, I think I, I don't even know what scenario would really bother me. First off, like, the actors on a show embody the characters. They become one, you know what I mean, over time. There's, like, an ownership there, you know? And it's like... You know, I remember, like, Omar, who played Charles on balls, was like, he's like, yo, there's too many curses in here. Charles wouldn't curse this much. I was like, yeah, bro, do whatever you want, you know? Oh, dude, that's great. It's like, that's great. Yeah, yeah, like, you're a stuffed line. Like, they're not, like, they're not, like, fucking robots, you know what right, I mean? Right. They're human beings who embody a character, and then, like, so... But I, I don't, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I've never had that experience. It would be weird, I think, if a visiting director started doing that. You'd be like, what? But like, we've never had that either. You right, know? right. So, you know, I mean, if he's like, I don't like this. Like, yeah. Like, Some uh -huh. in Hollywood, they just talk all this bullshit that I hear, and I'm like, come on, seriously? Like, you know, now you're you're spilling out the truth as far as, you know, you as a writer. If the, you know, if the actor's comfortable, you're like, yeah, fuck it, go, go, go along. I mean, I think, like, you could debate, like, you know, the delivery on a line, like, how it's supposed to be said right. so that it might come across more funny as yeah, opposed yeah, yeah. to some other, you know, inflected tone. But, you know, um, you know, or there's a line that somebody doesn't want to say for a specific reason mm -hmm. that you think is important. I mean, I think you have, like, you know healthy kind of like debates about these things yeah. but so what but certainly not in the audition process i think it was bizarre if somebody came into an audition and changed the entire <laughs> fucking context <laughs> right 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 or content of the scene i'd be like all right you know i'd probably just laugh i don't think i'd be like yo that's the person so on entourage you know? is it true based on the character billy walsh that was you how you well yeah you got but you got all the Billy Walsh out of me your first five minutes of this conversation. That was the insecurity, the crazy right. guy. He was like, I can't make this movie this way. I, right, right. I can't work with that guy. I need to go do the doubts. That's, that's what I was like prior mm -hmm. to. Basically, when we started doing the Queens Boulevard thing, Doug was like, you should be the director. It should be Rob Weiss, who hasn't made a movie in a decade. And, you know, you're coming out of retirement. But at the time... Like, again, I was probably insecure about acting, too, because I wasn't really an actor like that. But I was also like, I was like, I don't know, this show might be ridiculous. See, like, I don't want to embarrass myself <laughs> right. any further. Like, I didn't know. I couldn't, you know, Doug, Doug had a really good sense of, you know, particularly at that time, because I've gotten better at it now. Mm -hmm. But back then, I didn't really see it, which is the way that the words we put out how they would be received, right. what people would respond to. He just had a, he had a really strong intuition of that, you mm -hmm. know? And I think, um, you know, I, I didn't have that. So for right. me, it was like, I would just write and write, but, you know, I wasn't super connected to right. how it would be heard. Yeah, Rob, let me you ask you. know what I mean? More connected to how it's going to be said, not how it would be right. received. 
How was what was the schedule like when you were on the show Entourage? What, what would be like right. one day you show up, you got a uh, you know you got other writers helping you out, right? Tuesday, one. We were really, we were really a small crew, particularly in season one. Season one, it was just me, uh, <clears throat> me, Doug, Larry Charles, mm-hmm. Levinson. You know, who's also the EP of the show. Um, and I think maybe Matt Salzberg came in at one point. But it was super... Oh, shit. No, don't tell me I lost him. Dang. Stay there, stay there. Shit, come on, come on, stay there. Come on, Rob. Come back. Come back. Shit. Where is he? It's not here. Come on. Fuck. All right. Did I lose him? Are you there, Rob? Fuck. <sighs> well, it's not my end. I know that. All right, guys. I'm going to hang up, and I'm going to call him right back. I'm sorry for this. Where is he? 